We are here today at the Evident Inc. page with Dawn and Nancy and special guest, Becca Syme. I did that different than normal Dawn because I went back and looked at some of the videos and in every single one I say, and we're live. <laughs> <laughs> that looks much more professional right there. Oh, Did you forget our, our slide? Oh, well. That's okay. So we're going to let Becca introduce herself. So they know us. Tell us about you. Take it away, Becca. Just kidding. That's yeah. what I always say on my podcast. <laughs> Take it away. Uh, Hi, everybody. My name is Becca. I am a uh, writing coach and a writer of nonfiction and fiction. Um, you probably know me if you have heard my name before from the Write Better Faster class, which is what I teach, um, which is a combination. I always have a hard time explaining this class to people. I'm like, um, well, it started off as a productivity class and then it became bigger because productivity is not just one thing. It's not just about good information or good um, tactics. Like anybody who tells you that is lying to you. Uh, they don't know it, um, but they're lying to you. And um, so it, it sort of ballooned into, so the question we ask a lot is, can knowing yourself better help to make you a better, whatever, writer, marketer, person? And the answer is yes. And it may be the only thing for some of us that can actually help us be better or better faster. So, um, so I run that class and that Academy. We now have several classes and many coaches. Um, I coach strengths, uh, like, like strengths, but not muscles, um, in strengths in your brain, um, is my specialty. Um, I've been doing that for about 14 years and that is my, uh, I guess, I don't know, claim to fame. I'm not famous, but if I was, it would be for that. <laughs> you might be, at least in the romance writing community. Mm -hmm. I definitely. definitely a lot when I was at Romance Author Mastermind. <laughs> right, yes. Yes, with people who know me, I think I'm, I'm probably a known quantity, yeah. But yeah. I'm happy to not be known by anyone other than the people who know me. So you don't get mobbed when you're out at the, the restaurant. <laughs> Yeah. That is not true. That is not true. Yeah. I have tried walking through a lobby with Becca at a conference. Yeah. And conference. she does she does not get mobbed, but she does get stopped yeah. a lot. Yeah. 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 But I'm happy because they're all people that I like. Right? Yes. Yes. Same yes. In small circles. Yeah. Yes. So and we're excited to have you because we are talking about writer myths. Ooh. And um, but before we get into that. We always like to start off with a little, hey, what's going on in your world? Tell us about your life, that kind of thing. So tell us about your life. Oh, it, can I tell you guys like anything? Yes. Anything, anything? Well, okay. well this is going out into the world. <laughs> yes, it is That's TV, okay. Maybe. <laughs> That's okay. Because I, I watched this show yesterday and you know how it can be so hard to find a really good show. Like the show that you talk about with your friends and you cannot wait to like see the next episode. And I have a couple of friends who were always looking for that. Right. And I'm telling you people, I found the show to end all shows. If you're a sci-fi person at all, and I mean at all, um, if you're a sci-fi fan at all, if you like Nick Offerman at all um, from Parks and Rec fame, oh. Oh, yes. um, you have got to watch this show. It's called Devs, D-E-V-S. It is on Hulu right now if you're in the U.S. and it's on other things if you're not. But, um, oh, my gosh. I started watching the first episode because a friend was like, hey, you should check this out. And literally eight hours later, I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> like, it is, it's unbelievable. It is the most well-written TV show I have seen, I don't know, in years. So good. I've never even heard of it. Yeah, it's on FX, like the, the channel FX. Yeah. And uh, I never watched that, right? So I'm like, oh, I've never heard of it. Literally the last episode of the first season aired last night, right as I finished episode seven. Three minutes later, episode eight went live, and I'm like, oh, <laughs> it was meant to be. It was meant to be. It was so good. But yeah, check it out and then come and tell me that you watched it because I need for this show to become the next Firefly. 
because I need oh. more of it. Like, it's just amazing. Uh, it's so good. So yes, watch the show. Tell me what you think. All right. Now I have an assignment. Okay. No, now we got something to do. There's my Saturday right there. Click. Bye. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> Is it appropriate for my kids to watch or will they walk away because they, they'll think it's boring? Because that's okay too. <laughs> so it is rated TVMA because um, there's a lot of language in it, a fair amount of language. There's no nudity. There's no sex. There is a little bit of violence, yeah. um, especially in the first two episodes, but definitely not boring. If I mean, I think maybe kids might find it boring because it's not like jump cuts, yeah. you know, yeah. like TikTok style. But that's okay. Um, because that means they'll go do something else. <laughs> Right. Yes. And you can sit with your wide and like, uh, exactly. freak out about how good this show is. It's so All right. Good. I'm going to have to watch it. But first, we should talk about writing myths. So, oh, yes. Okay. Yes. Um, Don, do you, this? I think this was kind of your topic idea. Do you want to sort of introduce why we're going to talk about writing myths or why they're important or not important? I felt like we needed to do this because I have taken Becca's class and I love that she addresses all of these things that we're told as writers, especially brand new writers when you're out there looking for any information you can find and everything is you must do it this way or you can't, you absolutely can't do it that way. And then we realize as you get into it, that can be really detrimental to your creative process. Yep. That you're trying so hard to, especially with the person with like my type of personality, I'm trying so hard to make everybody happy because, oh, well, they said this is part of work. Oh, they'll say this. Oh, I must be doing it this way. And it gets exhausting. And then you don't write. Yep. And so I really, when we were talking about topics for what we wanted to do, I really felt like this was an important topic because the idea of being freed from that is awesome. <laughs> So yep. that's my, that's why we have to have this discussion. <laughs> and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> yes, I'm sticking to it. A little bit into the plotting versus pantsing thing we talked about last week, um, because mm. that's one of the things that I think new writers especially get a lot of pressure externally about. Like, you must use this plotting system. You must do it this way. And especially, you must plot, which. But yeah, should you? Yeah. So, so your big thing is like question the premise, yeah? Yep. And so can you talk a little bit about that? Like some of the things that writers get told and, and whether they need to listen to that or not? Yeah, I mean, first of all, anything you've ever been told about writing and literally every piece of advice you've ever, it's a myth to somebody. Right, like, and and part of the reason that I say that is because the core concept of question the premise is that there's a reason that people give that advice, and it's because it works for them, right? Or if they happen to be a teacher, it's because they've seen it work for multiple people. But the problem is they don't have enough data to actually tell you that it really does work for everybody, because yeah. what they don't see is the people that it doesn't work for who go home and hit their head against the wall or quit writing because it doesn't work for them and they never see those people or if they do they write them off as being lazy or disinterested or they don't have enough motivation or they're clearly not meant to be a writer which let me tell you how many times i've heard that from from students where like this teacher or this guru or whatever told me i just wasn't cut out to do this and meanwhile it's like well did, but did they actually listen to you and who you are and what's different about you and what makes you you or did they just give you like this generic catch-all whatever and it's always well they said you know like everybody has to plot or like i looked at the list you guys had and i'm like well you could do 10 times that many because literally every single thing you've ever been told about writing is a myth for at least 50 percent of the people out there because we are that different right. in our brains how we process everything um, and how you work and what your best way of working is maybe just not like them and they don't know that. Um, and so they're telling you that you're not cut out to do this and they don't know that, they don't know you. Like, and so that's like, for me, that's basically my spiel. That's why we question every premise is because if you accept a premise of something like, um, you know, one of the first ones you guys had, I think was like, 
uh, to study the process of successful writers in your genre is the best thing you can do. And I would always say, but is it? Like, how do you know if they have the same brain as you or just because you like to write the same thing, that's the only thing you have in common, but you're gonna model yourself after this person. Like you may be, you know, completely gonna block yourself because you're trying to be like them. So question the premise, you know, mm -hmm. that you've accepted. It seems like a lot of the myths that we that we let ourselves believe or buy into come from admiration of somebody who's successful. Yes. So yeah. we can look at like, oh, well, they always wear a purple shirt. So you have to wear a purple shirt. That must help. Yep. That kind of stuff. Yep. So it's a little bit of almost hero worship in a way. Yes. But it does not yeah. take into account their actual process like how do they get there why does that work for them why does it work for them like that literally is the question that nobody asks is why like and in, in at the very beginning of the quick cast that i do which is my youtube channel we talk about like anyone can say this worked for me and they can say it might not work for you but they can't tell you why and i can tell you why and the reason I say that is because like when you study success metrics and you understand the complexity of, let's say, why someone is successful is basically an algorithm. And it's like this plus this times this minus this divided by this carry this whatever. And that's why they're actually successful. It's not whatever they think it is which is often what happens with super successful people. They'll be like, well, I just locked myself in my room and wrote every single day. And I'm like, yeah, but that's not why you're successful. You're successful because you happen to be wired this way. And that thing you did aligns with your wiring. And that's why you're successful. It's not because you wrote every day. It's because you're working how you're meant to work best. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and I think with social media, there's so much pressure because we do see things come out from the super successful authors. Yep. And you see the cute little things that people make that are like, um, you know, you just have to write every day. Just turn on the faucet and write until the words come or you can't edit a blank page. And then it's attributed to some super successful author that maybe they said that maybe they didn't. Yeah. But that's where I think some of that pressure comes from. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. But as an editor, sometimes those super successful authors are irritating because you'll <laughs> find a new writer who has heard never to use an adverb. And so there were right. new adverbs in their entire manuscript. And like, but you, you actually need to say slowly here. Or, yeah, you know, right. yeah. or the one I hate is I can't use the word that. So they take it out. And then their sentences are very awkward because occasionally the word that is actually required. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> Yes. So no advice it should be applied in a blanket manner, I guess. Nope. Nope. And the rules are always, I mean, you know, the Pirates of the Caribbean, right? Where they're like, oh, the Pirates Code. and Oh, they're more like guidelines. And I'm like, that is what all, literally all writing rules should be. And it's hard because the people who argue the most for this, like the, the thing plotting, everybody needs to plot books in order to be faster is a big myth, right? The problem is that the people who are saying that are so hardwired to be successful in that way that they literally can't imagine a way in which you could be successful as a pantser. They can't even fathom the possibility, right? Right. And so when you ask them, well, but Becca said I could be a pantser and be okay. And they'll be like, she's wrong. You're an idiot. Be a plotter, you know, et cetera. They may not be that mean because most of them are just really well-meaning, uninformed people. But I can tell you like the, the gamut of people that I have coached towards success by using very individualized, customized stuff. I can tell you a hundred percent for certain that I have clients who make a million dollars or more who are pantsers to the core, literally to the core. Like they can't, they couldn't plot if you paid them money to do it <laughs> because it would ruin their, their process. Yeah. And the whole key is does the way that you're wired support what you are doing to be successful? And if it doesn't, then you have to let yourself stop doing it no matter who told you to do it. Well, and I think we oh. should, we, sorry, Donna, I didn't mean to walk all over you there. Um, 
because we keep kind of leaning into the idea of strengths and that's something that you coach, um, it might be worth mentioning what, what you mean when you say strengths. Yeah. So the, there's a universal success metric that was discovered by a uh, psychologist named Donald Clifton. And, and when I say discovered, I literally mean discovered, like he approached the problem as a, a complete scientist, right? It's like, I think there's a way that all successful people who are like, they're successful in similar ways, but not the same as each other, right? They're each individualized ways of success, but each of those has a slot. And he's like, I, it seems like there's gotta be a pattern here. So let's go do some investigating. So they literally interviewed 2 million of the best of the best um, and in every different um, field that they could possibly find exhaustive interviews, trying to figure out how are you so successful? And what they found at the end of all this interview process was there were very specific patterns that everybody who had these eight or nine things had them all. Everybody who did these did them all, right? And so they came up with this metric to test for that called the Clifton Strengths Assessment. And it's 34 different brands of success essentially and so you find out like what is my success style how am i going to be the best version of myself and then we help to coach you through that process and there's a lot of information on our youtube channel as well but um to help you find the best version of yourself that you can be so you don't have to listen to you know whoever like whatever doesn't resonate with you and I have completely drank the Kool-Aid at this point. I took a class and I'm just completely fascinated by the strengths. Um, looking for a word that's not coming to me. Framework. Um, yes. And I have actually found that since I took the class and kind of addressed my own strengths, I've been able to combat some of the myths that I've been holding on to as a writer. Um, and it's very freeing to be able to look at something that you've always been told, this is how you do this, and be able to say, you know what? It actually not for me. Maybe that's how mm -hmm. you <laughs> Yeah, not for me. It works for you and that's okay, yep. but not for me. Yeah. So yeah. And do that's, we wanna look at that's super important just before we go into the myths too, I wanna say when it is works for someone, it really works for them. And usually it works so well that it make they make it look easy. Like when mm -hmm. you when you talk to somebody who's a real plotter, they make it look like any idiot could do this. And that's kind of also how they feel about it, right? Is yeah. like, well, but anyone can do this. It'll make it so much easier. And that's the seductive lie that we all buy into about these myths is that because someone was so certain when they told me this, or because two different gurus agree on this or whatever, then that means that it must be true for everybody. No, not at all. Like, no. Yeah, share a writing myth. Let's hear them because I can guarantee you everything <laughs> you've ever heard is a myth, right? Okay, um, time for Becca to start taking things apart for us. Mm -hmm. so we we so have a couple to toss in. You want to shoot one out, Don? Yeah, well, we're going to start with the most obvious or what I feel is the most obvious one, the one that we hear the most, and that is you must write every day. No. No. Well, like, logistically, so, that's probably impossible. First of all. Yes. I mean, for most people, it's interesting because there are certain strengths where when you have them, you really should write every single day. And it not just that it will uh, it will help you to feel better about the process, but also you'll get more writing done. Right. So there's that sort of brand of person. The opposite brand of person, literally, if they try to write every day, it will make them stop writing completely. Like for some people who try this, they can't even sit down and make words come out and they feel so guilty that they can't make the words come out, but they're like, oh, I shouldn't be a writer. This is so awful. I can't write every day. And they feel so bad about it. And I want to be like, seriously, you're following a success pattern of plenty of successful people who can't write every day because they have to, and there are multiple reasons, right? Sure. But the most common one is, because they have to think so much before they can get the words out that they literally need to like not sit in front of the computer and stare at the cursor. They need to walk away mm -hmm. and think. And then when they finish thinking, the words will come out. That's just like the faucet, right? 
Here's one that was shared by James Gallagher. Write only what you know. Oh, so that would be a well. It'd be a pretty boring set of yeah, books yeah. In my case, <laughs> right. One, of course, the the why behind this one, like write what you know, comes from that idea that well. So there's two two sort of fields in this. One is that if you know it, you'll talk more authentically about it. Like you'll know details that some people don't know. Um, which is not untrue for some people, but then that forgets that there's this opposite brand of person who actually does intuitively know how things align. Like the, I've, Nora Roberts is a perfect example. She writes this amazing Montana set series that she's never been to Montana in her entire life. And she intentionally does not go Comes because now my very favorite books. And yeah, like the, yeah she's never been there. And she will say like to anybody who asks her, she's like, Nope, not going to do it because the fictional place exists as a place in her head. And she doesn't want to mess mm -hmm. it up with reality. But some people just know how to make details align. Yeah. Like they think about things like how weather affects, you know, your activities and whatever. And, but, but I think write what you know comes from a good place again, similarly to write every day. It's just, not everybody's wired like that where they need to write what they know. Some people can make stuff up and it is so realistic. You wouldn't even know they'd never been there. Right. K.I. Lynn says, and I think this was in reference to you saying some people need to think before they can sit down and write. So they don't write every day. She says, Becca, you just described me. So yeah. <laughs> you tell yeah. a lot of other people too. <laughs> Well, that's what's so great about it too, is that this isn't just me. A lot of personality metrics, get a bad rap because they were basically some one person looking at the world and saying there's four types of people. And so let's create a test that tests for those four types of people that I just decided there are with my <laughs> magical thinking brain. Right. <laughs> but the difference between that and what Gallup did or what Dr. Clifton did, who eventually um, signed up with Gallup is that he looked at the breadth of human existence, the breadth of culture, the breadth of everything, right? Like it was, I want to see if there's a pattern that will exist, that will emerge from the data. And what happens when you do that is if you are doing it correctly, like if you're being um, ob objective and thorough, you will find the pattern that exists there because it will naturally emerge for you. And that's what he did. So what we use as the basis of our way to help authors, especially in our Strengths for Writers program, is something that is so accurate that it's almost uncanny how accurate it is sometimes. And I bet this has happened to both of you guys. When you read something from your Strengths report and you were like, are you following me around, Becca? Do you, <laughs> do you have a camera in my house? And I'm like, no, I've, like when we're the same, we're so the same, but that means that when we're different, we're so opposite. It's just, it's, it's uncanny. Yeah. It's very yeah. interesting. So, uh, another, okay. one. Oh, Go ahead. sorry, I was just going to throw out another myth, um, that you should never edit as you go. Oh, you should just spit it all out. And I have to, I have to say, I have clients who I work with on story coaching who will apologize to me of, I know I'm not supposed to edit as I go, but I had to go back to this chapter here and fix it. So explain that to us. <laughs> so editing as you go, the reason that people say don't do it is because they are preferencing the value of getting quickly through a draft, mm -hmm. right? Like that's the value that they have. They feel like somehow if you're, if you're allowing your inner critic access to your creativity, that it's going to slow the process down and it, and you're not going to get as good of a product. The problem is that's not true for everybody, right? So what happens when that is a process that works for you, that sort of fast vomit drafting is that if you do stop to think about something, you don't get a significantly different product from that person if you think about it. So then it feels like the thinking was a waste of time. But the problem is, while there is that side of the spectrum and those people do exist, the flip side is you have to think and think and think and think about something in order to get to the actual place that is the best version of what you could be writing. And then additionally, there are people for whom 
mistakes behind them in the manuscript don't bother them, right? That's one side of the continuum. But the flip side of that continuum is I can't move on when there are mistakes behind me because I'm a linear writer and it is, um, it's going to distract me to know that I had the wrong character names back here, or I wrote the wrong version of this event or whatever. And so then I'm like constantly fighting with myself to get forward because I've been told not to go back and edit that. And I'm like, go back and edit. Yeah. Who cares? Getting through your first draft fast is only important if it's important to you, right? right? Like if it's going to help your process, then do it. it. And if it's yeah. not, then ignore it. Yeah. Well, getting into the first draft fast goes into our next myth, which is you must release X number of books per month, per year, per week, per day, whatever, per to day. be successful. <laughs> oh, right. I was going to say, wait, what's the end of that? Uh, what's, <laughs> what's the end of that? Um, because there definitely is, and again, like everything, there's a place where the myth is true and a place where it isn't. Um, so the place where it's true is if you are writing in a certain style of genre or a certain a cer in certain places, um, you know, Kindle Unlimited is more common. Some of the bigger, heavier hitting, more money making, um, more packed genres, this is more important. Um, if you are only interested in making money and if you can write fast, right? Then, because if, if any one of those aren't true, then we've got a glitch, we have a problem, right? So this is where we talk about success alignment. Um, it's possible, but again, it's there are plenty of people who are releasing 12 books a year, 24 books a year who are not making good money. So if that was the key to success, then everyone who did it would be successful, but that's not the key, right? Once again, the key is alignment. So the, the reason they say that is because there is a section of the market for which that is the best practice currently. And if you are capable of doing that and also can write a good story for that market, then that is the best practice. But there is an equal number of people for whom that doesn't matter to their readers how often they release because they're still going to buy the books. And I have clients who literally release a book a year and make a million bucks. So like it's this whole thing of like, you have to do it this one way. This is the only way you can do it. Anytime you hear that you need to question the premise. So we call it QTP. Anytime anybody tells you there's only one way to be successful, literally QTP. I can give you like, the, the common metrics, right, are 68% of the people it works for and then the other 32 or whatever it doesn't work for. Like that's just standard distribution. So we need to be more conscious of the fact that that applies to all advice equally. Fair enough. I would like to know, it, though, those people who release one book a year and make a million dollars, I, I just, I'll do whatever they do. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> exactly. you're saying, and yet I'm like, what are they doing? <laughs> yeah, see, that's what's so hard is that the things that they have in common are usually things that we can't control about ourselves, right? right? It's things like they just hit a magic uh, idea, mm -hmm. and and again, there are as many people who are writing magic ideas on that side of the spectrum that haven't hit yet because it's not their time or they release at the wrong time or the wrong place. But once again, there is an equal number of people who are failing at the 24, right. 12 books a year model as there are to people who are failing at the one, two, three, four books a year model. And so the, the key again is if you don't understand that this industry is capricious and unfair, and if you don't understand that there is no way to guarantee success, period, regardless, like you're going to be, you know, not you personally, right? Like, but I mean, you, the royal you author, yeah. Um, you're always going to be frustrated, and because the success is just not predictable in this industry. So I think going to the opposite of what we've been talking about about writing fast and you need to write every day and that part. Like one of the other ones that came up is the muse will come and then I'll write. Oh, right. The things yeah. that writers tell themselves that yep. yes. are myths. Yep. So for this one to QTP, I would always say, like, again, there's a place where it's true and a place where it's not. 
the place where it's true is that there definitely are some people for whom the muse, which is a very strange way of talking about the fact that you're being, that you know what to write and you're inspired and, you know, like all of the stars align at one time, right? There definitely are people who cannot write without that being present. There are very few that I have, you know, coached over the years. The larger number of people are, you have to think about it first and then the muse will come. You know, you need to walk away. You have to clear the decks first. Like there are all these other things that might be happening where you're sitting around and waiting for inspiration to strike, but it really is just, have you done your due diligence to prepare yourself to be writing? Right. And because I do think there's a place where we want to not just say like, oh, just do whatever you want, because many times we don't want to write um, or it's not we're not in a fun place. And so it's not as exciting and we have a job to do. Right. So like question the premise needs to apply equally, I think, to all of those, all of the places. Yeah. Well, so there's another one that's a little bit, I don't know if it's so much of a myth. Uh, um, I threw this one on there because we hear it from clients when we're editing. Mm -hmm. um, my characters take over and they, you know, I, I plotted, I knew what I was going to write, but then my characters took over. So, because we might say, well, you know, this scene kind of wanders and goes off in a weird direction. Maybe we should tighten it up. And they'll be like, well, I mean, I, I didn't write that, right? My characters took over. And right. <laughs> that's actually not okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when, which is really interesting because for me, I think that is a myth. There's a place where that's a myth and there's a place where it isn't. I have said those words about my yes. own writing. So I know that you can feel that way. Yes. But your character shouldn't write your book, maybe? Well, but for some people they should. But it, but yeah. it, it, it <laughs> depends on what the product is like, right? So the people that I know who do that, whose characters write their books, who are what we call intuitive writers, right? Where yeah. they don't need to plot. They don't, um, they still have to edit. <laughs> like they still have to edit because if, if you are, if you've gotten multiple opinions about a scene that your characters wandered off and did, and no one is interested in what's going on, then you need to edit that out. I don't care what the characters did in the first draft, but to say, that no one should let their characters write their book is also not true because there are people who should do that. And then the way that you test how good of a job you did is how the readers are staying in tune with you. And then you learn, because that's the key for me is when you are a super intu intuitive writer, you do still have to learn how to be better. Because if you're not, um, like, let's just say the, the reason that the characters write the book happens is because they have certain personality strengths that help them to know and understand character on a deeper level than your average, you know, person without those strengths does. And so they know intuitively what should be happening, but they're not infallible. Like, that's the key to me is like, if, if I'm bored as a reader, then you have not done your job as a writer. And if you need to make this more interesting to me for some reason, or if the characters are really supposed to do this thing that they've wandered off and done, then you need to make it a lot more interesting than it is right now, because I am not interested in the story where it goes. That's a learning point for those intuitive writers because they need to learn that not everything about your characters is equally as interesting to your reader unless you make it matter. Yeah. And so you've got to listen to your editors in that way, because if you're an intuitive writer and you have to treat it as a learning experience rather than, well, I'm just going to let my characters do this. Well, okay, you're, you, you can do that. You're the writer, but I'm telling you I was bored and that doesn't matter to you. Like that should matter to you. Yeah. Yes. And I, I wish we had a little banner of what she just said of listen to your editors. <laughs> We can make one here. <laughs> we are here yeah. to help. We love yeah. you. We love your characters. We don't want your readers to be bored. I think that's very important. So yes, listen yeah. to your editors. I feel like one, that needs emphasis. I love yeah. what Neil Gaiman says, and, and this sometimes helps those more intuitive, uh, intuitive writers. There we go. <laughs> um, he says, 
whenever somebody tells you that they don't like something about your book, they're always right. They're often wrong about why they're bored and about how to fix it. And so if you're going to argue with your editors about my characters need to do this thing and because that's where they went, then fine, argue with them. And But you still have to fix whatever is wrong. Because if they're bored, they're bored. Yeah. Like, yes. <laughs> and that is your problem to fix as a writer. Yeah. Well, and one other uh, myth I wanted to be sure that we addressed is that writer's block is just a lack of discipline. Oh, good God. Yeah. Sorry, <laughs> I didn't mean to. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so I'm currently doing a series about that right now on my podcast because this is this is the most damaging and difficult uh, advice that I see. Uh, the people for whom this is true, that kind of like, negativity and criticism really helps them. They thrive in it. They like that push. Uh, so they're the kind of person who, if you challenge them, they'll be like, screw you. I'm going to do that. Like, yeah, you're right. I'm on discipline. Let's go. I'm going to write right now. Like if that's not the response to that advice that's internal to you, and instead you start feeling shameful, then you're more likely going over to this side of the continuum which is that when you're blocked sometimes as a writer, it has literally nothing to do with your discipline, not even like, not even a little bit sometimes. You could not be more motivated sometimes when you're blocked. You could not want to write more than you do, but there's something that's blocking you. And it might be internal, it might be uh, you're thinking about the book, you might have to go think about it more. Um, but it might also be a good reason. So sometimes writer's block is extremely productive for the right types of writers. And this myth that somehow we should just be sitting down and constantly writing words and never stopping to think or never walking away or never replotting or whatever, or not like it, it's so damaging and it's so damaging to some writers that they will walk away from writing because that advice has made them feel like they're not a real writer because they can't just break the block. And, uh, but on the flip side, I get where these people are coming from, right? Like for themselves, when they are lacking an, an ability to write, it is because they're not just sitting down and getting it done. Right. So there absolutely are people for whom that advice is, is good advice. But when it's not good advice, it's often career killing. Um, and that's why that's why I responded the way I did, because I hate hearing that. Yeah, because usually the people who are internalizing it are not the people for whom it works. There are the people for whom it doesn't. And, and I see people literally end their careers because of it. And it, it just breaks my heart makes me mad. <laughs> I will admit to it, having felt that, if not having said it, although I probably have said it because you know my type now. Yeah, I know your strengths. Yeah. And the, for me, if I'm not writing, it is because I'm just, I don't feel like it and I'm not making myself go sit down in the chair. It's, yep. but it's, well, it, here the it's, it's also very much the, if you tell me I can't do something, yeah. I'm going to go do it. Mm -hmm. And take a picture. So, <laughs> yeah. So and that's a generative place, too. right? Like mm -hmm. that's success. So for your type of personality, success looks like, hang on, the expectation is that I should be right. Okay, let's go do it, right? Like there's no judgment about it because it's it's generative for you. It's positive yeah. when it isn't. And, and when it crushes you or when it whatever, it, but, but again, you highlighted something that I, I need to be clear that I, I say this. People who give this advice are not bad people. Pe <laughs> writers who say this to each other are not bad. None of these myths, right? Nothing right. anyone says. It just means that they haven't seen enough data yet of the people who are on the other side of the spectrum from them. Like I would guarantee you, if I brought some of these writers to the door of these famous people who are giving these advice out and said, okay, let me show you how your advice stopped them from writing mm -hmm. and, and how we fixed that. And now they're better. I guarantee you, they would be like, okay, I'm going to caveat that from now on because 
I don't want to end anybody's career because of something that I said, because they're good people, right? When, when someone says something like that, I think for all of these myths, it comes from a place of like, hey, I found this thing that works for me. You go, like you mm -hmm. recommending the television yeah. show earlier. <laughs> I like this, yeah. so try it, you know? Yep. Yeah, and some people will not like devs, right? And I'm okay with that. <laughs> like, I'm okay with that in my heart of hearts, even though I don't understand it. <laughs> but I know there will be people who won't like it. And, and and that's exactly the same as every myth. The problem is that we're so used to best practice that we feel like when somebody who's really successful tells us something, we're like, oh, well, this must be best practice for all writers and all writers should do this because, of course, that's what they say. Mm -hmm. All writers should write every day. All, no writer should edit. And you can't edit a blank page. You know, it's like, well, but you can. You, you can. And, uh, and some of you should be editing blank pages in your head before you put them on paper. And, and it's not anybody being mean or stupid. It literally is just like they are so successful in that one way yeah. that it's all they can see. They can't imagine success in another way. And so I try to help them imagine success in another way. And that's great. And this, the second part of this, which you just kind of already led into that we wanted to talk just kind of briefly on is how do you take, now that we know these are myths and we know this isn't the way that you have to do it, how do you set some real, realistic expectations as a writer? So the first thing I always look at when we coach writers is how have you been successful in the past? What has worked for you? And so many people have a story that's similar to this. Well, I started off doing X and then I heard Y guru give a talk at Z conference and then I tried to do this and now I can't write. And I'm like, okay, well, cause and effect says we need to go back to where you were being successful and go back there again. And they're like, oh, but I was pantsing. And I'm like, so pants, like there are plenty of successful pantsers out there. And so some of it is looking back at your past successes and seeing not just in writing either, it might be in your job, right? Like it might be, especially if you do anything on your own, like if you are a self, um, uh, self-employed self person or if you have a lot of autonomy at your job, which is what writing is like, um, when have you had success in the past? The other piece is, and this is a little bit more nebulous, it's harder to define, um, if you've tried something and you have not had success with it, you are not stupid. There's nothing wrong with you. There is likely a success metric that is causing you to not be able to accomplish that. I can't tell you how many people are just not capable of running Facebook ads the way that insert name here has taught whoever, you know, because it's not any one person. It literally is any Facebook ad class and they'll take. 15 different teachers classes and come to me and be like, I can't, what's wrong with me? Why am I so stupid? And I'm like, you know, then we walk through like, well, how do you do this? And how do you do this? Okay. Well then you just need to run them this way and not worry about what everybody says. And they're like, it can't possibly be that easy. And usually when you say it can't possibly be that easy, the answer is yes, it can. <laughs> <laughs> so you have another question here, Becca. Um, Dana would like to know, He's questioning the premise. Are there no yes. absolutes? That is a perfect question. Um, I would actually say, so I'm going to say there are no absolutes, and I'm going to say except for the fact that. Uh-oh. Oh, no. We were about to hear the answer. <laughs> Becca, come back. I know she's fun. She leaned forward. I wonder if she hit a button or something. I think she can come back. Um, oh, there she is. Oh, is she back? Okay. <laughs> there you are. Where did you go? <laughs> I was like, and the answer is, and then you're gone. <laughs> um, yeah, I was trying to see who had asked the question so I could see. So Dana, thank you for, for asking that question. Um, I'm tempted to say there are no absolutes other than that there are no absolutes, but then that's an absolute, right? So that's not a fair thing to say. Um, I would say, yes, there are no absolutes. And by that, I mean, like I've been doing this for years. So I've been doing a success coaching on some level for 14 years. I've been coaching writers, actively coaching writers for six. I've coached 
thousands of writers on every level. And I have yet to see anything other than alignment with who you are, like other than literally that magic alignment, right? Which sometimes you have to work towards or understand. I have yet to see any one thing that every single successful person has in common. And I would even caveat that by saying, I have at least one client who I know works actively against their personality because of a job that they had that set them up to be able to work in this specific way, right? Like they're super high in intellect and thinking, processing, but they they were a journalist. And so they were trained to write very quickly without thinking um, on that level. And, and so now they write fiction that way and they're not particularly well aligned for it other than that their experiences brought them there. Um, so even that, there's an exception to the rule, right? So I would say, I would say the only absolute is, well, but even then, so, okay. So I was going to say the only <laughs> absolute is, do you want to sit down and write? And then write if you, you know, write if you can, but then you have those times where you're moving or there's a pandemic or someone dies and you can't write. You're still a writer. If that happens, you can always come back to it. Um, you could release series that don't sell. You're still a writer. You can still sell, right? Like there's just no, there's just no absolute, right? And, and so I, I apologize for that being so long, but I really think there's just, there's no advice that anyone can ever give you that would work for literally every person. Cause I could come in and two seconds and be like, well, except for these 17 people who are all doing really well and they did that. Right. So I'm like, really, there is no absolute. That's a great question. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. All right. Do you have any parting shots or final things that we need to hit? I want to point out that Becca has a book called Dear Writer, You're Doing It Wrong. You can actually see the cover of it back behind her a little bit um, that covers these types of myth and gives some really great information about how to deal with them, how to free yourself from being tied to it and that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. And we have a quick cat, uh, the quit Q-U-I-T-C-A-S-T on YouTube that's free. You don't have to pay anything for it. And we have a whole playlist about question the premise and what we're trying to do is going through systematically as many of these things as we can and and not just to say trust me I'm a coach trust me right it's like well here's the data here's how your personality works and here's you know who's most likely to uh, succeed at this and who isn't and why and um yeah so we we try to be as exhaustive as we can but yeah check us out there I think too because it's you know, it's easy. It's free. Awesome. So we'll put, um, or we'll have Becca maybe drop some links, um, of places people yeah. can find you and your books and your classes and all that good stuff, um, yeah. on the Evident Inc. site here when we wrap up. But we need to thank you for spending your time with us today. This has been super interesting. Thank you. Yeah. I'm happy to be here. I love talking about QTP. It's my favorite thing to talk about. <laughs> Uh, I talk about it literally in line at the grocery store and on the plane, although neither of those places currently because <laughs> we have <to> quarantine. <laughs> but, yeah. Well, uh, and I have to say too, if you spend enough time around Becca, oh. you will start hearing Becca's voice in your head yeah. saying, but do you? But should you? <laughs> but do you? So I have learned guys, that I can throw those comments over onto the screen. I apologize for anyone who had an awesome comment that I didn't get to put up earlier. Um, but now, like the one to... that says, "I love my editors. I well, need you." That would yes, we need that one. <laughs> yes, <laughs> we're just gonna leave that one there for a little bit. <laughs> so, but this um, has been great. Thank yeah. you very much, Becca. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you guys for having me. And thank you guys. I I will uh, go over to Facebook. And if you have any questions um, about anything, just throw them in the comments on this video and I'll come in and, uh, and answer them. Oh, that'd be great. So great. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. And we will see you again next week. Do we want to talk about what we have coming up next week? Oh, you just got me before <laughs> we officially like ended the broadcast. <laughs>
Um, I would say yes, if only I could remember. I know we have, a, we have two guests coming up. I don't remember Next, what order. This is why you have me. I know. Next <laughs> Um, next week, we have Ronnie Loren yes. as a guest, and she is going to be talking a little bit about writer productivity and how you awesome. set yourself up for success there. And then the week after that, which I believe is April 30th, is Mindy your friend. Mindy Klasky. Yeah, she's like the queen of the trope, or at least her website is sort of the absolute standard for where to go look for a list of tropes, at least in romance writing. Oh, cool. um, so we're going to talk about tropes and why they're important and how they get a bad rap. So that's tropes what we're talking awesome. about. Tropes are awesome. I my husband now uses because I've explained to him what tropes are. He will start talking about stuff where it doesn't apply at all and be like, "Well, you know, I mean, it's just that trope." And I'm like, "Stop saying that." <laughs> <laughs> use that it word. has to be a real trope in order for it to be a trope. It can't just yes. be like exactly. some story you saw once. <laughs> yeah, that's not a trope. <laughs> No. Okay, so right. now we can say goodbye. Okay. <laughs> goodbye. Bye. <laughs>